Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to continue chapter 5. In the last video, we ended it by writing down an equation that was regarded as our mathematical statement of the second law. In other words, we had a formulation for entropy. Now, what we want to discuss is that the best way to really understand that formulation for entropy is to learn to calculate changes in entropy. The most important thing to remember in doing entropy calculations is that it must be calculated along a reversible path. In considering an irreversible process, um, entropy must be calculated for a reversible process that's going to proceed between the same initial and final states corresponding to that irreversible process. Now we know entropy is a state function, so it is uh, path independent provided that the transformation is still between the same initial and final states in both processes. Now, that's a lot of information verbally to throw at you, but let's consider this uh, calculating changes in entropy for two cases that are first uh, not going to, not going to, consider any calculations in all right these these two cases are going to require no calculations let's first look at a reversible adiabatic process all right for a reversible adiabatic process well we know that the heat um heat changes for for an adiabatic process is going to be zero all right so we're going to write that down q rev is equal to zero all right, so that means if we're going to try to calculate our entropy, all right, our entropy is a function of changes in heat, right? We have a term in our entropy formulation that is related to Q to heat. And so that means if, our, if we're considering an adiabatic process where our heat exchange, our heat transfer is zero, then our entropy is also going to be zero. All right. Now, for any cyclic process, entropy changes in entropy is going to be zero because the change in any state function for a cyclic process is zero, like we've covered previously. All right. Next case we want to consider. Right. That was pretty easy. We didn't have to do any hard math. Let's consider our second case. This one is a reversible isothermal expansion or compression process. All right. And again, this is for an ideal gas. That's important to keep in mind. All right, we want to figure out, we want to calculate changes in entropy for such a process. All right, we're going to take the case of volume initial, temperature initial is going to change to volume final temperature initial, right? Isothermal process, our temperature is not changing, but we're considering a process where our volume is. All right, now, the change in internal energy for this process is, is zero because this is an isothermal process. All right. We know our internal energy and our enthalpy are, di are directly related to temperature. If temperature does not change, all right, both of those quantities will be zero. All right. So we write that down. Internal energy is equal to zero. All right. Now, because internal energy is equal to zero, what does that mean? Well, we know our definition of internal energy is work plus heat, but if internal energy is zero, then what we can write is a relationship just between heat and work. All right, let's move work to the other side. And what we get is heat is related to minus work. We're going to use that to our advantage. All right, because we know how to calculate work for a reversible process, we can use this relationship. NRT, natural log of volume final over volume initial. All right, this, all right, is a formulation that we're going to use to plug into our entropy term, right? We know our relationship between heat and work, and we know how to calculate work, but that's going to equal heat, just negative valued, all right? We're going to take this, and we're going to write our entropy term here, replacing our, our Q reversible term with this formulation right here, all right? When we do that... All right, what we write is this 1 over t term, all right, times q reversible, which we know to be nRT natural log of v final over v initial. Of course, these t terms are going to cancel each other out. We have one in the numerator, one in the de denominator. What we obtain is a relationship for change in entropy that is just number of moles, gas constant, natural log of v final over v initial. 
So we have a method of calculating changes in entropy for a reversible isothermal expression or compression where this volume is changing. All right. So notice. Notice from this formulation, there's going to be a consequence of this. All right. Change in entropy is going to be greater than zero for an expansion. Why? Because V final is going to be greater than V initial. Entropy. All right. And entropy is obviously uh, a consequence of that relationship. Entropy is going to be less than zero for a compression process. Why? Because V final will obviously be smaller than V initial in a compression process. All right. Fantastic. Now, why does entropy, why does entropy increase with increasing volume at constant temperature? All right. To answer this, we can look at the system at the microscopic level. All right. Translational energy levels of atoms and molecules are going to be shifted to lower energies as the volume of the system increases. Now, this might not make 100% sense to you yet, right? It will make more sense as you um, cover stat mech later on and even quantum mechanics. But take that, take that as a just a as a piece of information for now. That's true. All right, the translational energy levels for atoms and molecules are going to be shifted to lower energies as the volume of the system increases. That means more states of the system can be accessed at constant temperature if you increase that volume. All right, and if you're at, if you're increasing the number of states your system can access, your entropy will also increase as a consequence. All right. Remember when we talked about microstates and macrostates, right? Your entropy term, your entropy definition there at the beginning, right? It was in it had a relationship. It was proportional to the number of microstates you can access. If you increase the number of states that the system can be accessed, aka your microstates, all right, then your entropy increases, and that happens at constant temperature as volume increases, all right. Now, next, what we want to consider for an ideal, we want to consider an ideal gas that undergoes reversible change in temperature at either constant volume and constant pressure. We're going to consider both. All right. So for a constant volume, reversible process at constant volume, but your temperature is changing. All right. You have VITI, initial volume, initial temperature changes. You keep the volume initial. The volume isn't changing, but you have this new final temperature. All right. Your temperature is changing. What we can write here for 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 DQ then. All right. Is that your your change in heat is going to be related to your specific heat capacity as a function of temperature. So we can write CVDT. All right. What that means is we're going to use this to insert into our entropy calculations, right? Because we have a relationship between en entropy and our heat. All right, we can plug, we can plug this in. Uh, our specific heat capacity, um, with changes in temperature or specific molar heat capacity here with a a mole term over temperature. All right, and if we integrated this for entropy, all right, what we get is that changes in entropy. All right, is a po approximately your number of moles, your molar, your specific uh, molar heat capacity, natural log of T final over T initial. So now we have a formulation for changes in entropy when temperature is changing, but you have constant volume. All right, so it's important to know, all right, when t we're, we're, we're discussing all these specific scenarios, right, so that you know what formulation of entropy to use with different conditions. Now, what about for constant pressure but changing temperature? All right, then your your change in uh, heat term is now uh, molar uh, uh, molar uh, specific heat capacity, but at constant pressure conditions as opposed to constant volume conditions. All right, and then we can go ahead and plug that into our entropy. All right, right here, and what we get is now changes in entropy for constant pressure conditions is also moles molar spe uh, specific molar heat capacity at constant volume, natural log of T final over T initial. All right, so now we have these different formulations. All right, of entropy changes in entropy for different 
scenario is one where you're discussing a cyclic process, one where you're discussing isothermal expansion or compression, all right? Ones where you're discussing constant volume uh, conditions, but your temperature changes, and then ones where you're considering constant pressure, but your temperature is changing. Oh, now we have different formulations of entropy for each of those scenarios, all right? That are disposable to you considering what your what your word problem might ask if you're doing practice problems. All right. Fantastic. Now, we said entropy is a state function. Entropy is independent of the path. That means any reversible or irreversible process for an ideal gas can be described. Uh, can be described um by treating it in smaller segments as well. So for example, right, we considered all these all these cases of um you know changes in, in volume but isothermal changes in temperature at constant volume, ch uh changes in temperature at constant pressure. What if you get asked to write a change in entropy formulation for something like this? You start off V initial temperature initial, but you change it through the process to a new final volume and a new final temperature, all right? What can we do? Well, how do we approach a problem like this when we want to write our change in entropy? Well, what we can do is treat this whole process, all right, in two segments. One that occurs at constant volume and another that occurs at constant temperature. So what you can actually consider this to be, all right, is two segments one where you're doing v initial t initial to v final t initial all right that's segment one and segment two where you go v final t initial to v final t final all right and you can add both of these entropy changes together we know what uh what our formulation for change in entropy for con for isothermal uh compression or expansion we wrote it right here all right, we can take this formulation, all right, and then that's for segment one, and we have to add it to segment two to really get the change in entropy for a process like this. Well, we also did um, constant volume change in temperature uh, entropy calculations. It gives us this following formulation. We also insert it. So to write the entropy change for such a process, consider two segments, add them together to truly express the change in entropy for a process like that. All right. Similarly, for any reversible or irreversible process, for example, with pressure, all right, you have pressure initial, temperature initial that goes to P final, T final. All right. You can do the same thing, break this down into two segments and write the change in entropy for both of those segments. All right, this segment would be P initial, T initial to P final, T initial. And this one would be for uh, P final, T initial to P final, T final. All right, and so you can write it, write it as an expression of um, addition for two segments. You can break these down into these, these um, changes into two segments that you know the entropy formulation for and add them together. Now, one more thing is we can consider entropy for phase changes and how we write the relationships for that. All right. Um, experience is going to show us that liquid is converted to, to gas at a constant boiling temperature through heat input if the process is carried out at constant pressure. All right. What that means for the reversible process is that we can write our entropy change for vaporization. All right. As delta um, enthalpy change of vaporization over temperature vaporization. All right. And we can do the same thing for fusion as well. If you're going from solid to liquid. All right. Entropy of fusion is just the enthalpy change of fusion over temperature of fusion. All right. You can actually uh, take these formulations, these are for ideal gases, and write them for real gases, solids, and liquids. And actually, we can, we're can we going to write these formulations as we consider this practice problem right here. This problem says, one mole of CO2 gas is transformed from an initial state characterized by this initial temperature and this initial volume to a final state characterized by this temperature final, volume final. 
all right? You want to use the proper equations for this to calculate your change in entropy. Well, the thing is here, what are we considering? We're going from V initial, uh, temperature initial, ultimately to V final, uh, T final. The thing is here, we're using this, um, we want to calculate that change in entropy here, all right? Um, and we want to use ideal gas values for um, for beta and kappa. If you remember, beta is our volumetric thermal expansion coefficient from all the way chapter 2, and kappa is our isothermal compressibility values. Now, when you're considering changes in entropy for arbitrary processes that involve real gases, solids, liquids, all right, where you have your beta and kappa values, all right, you can calculate your change in entropy for this process using the following equations. All right, so if you're given, uh, if you're given um, calculating your delta S, your entropy change, using beta and kappa, what you can write for entropy change is the following equation. All right, you have your change in temperature. Uh, a part and your change in volume part your change in temperature is based off of your heat capacity over temperature right uh and your change in volume is going to be related to your beta over kappa values and essentially you can write this all right your change in entropy is your specific heat capacity at constant volume natural log of t final minus t initial plus your beta kappa values all right which we said are your isobaric volumetric thermal expansion coefficient and your isothermal compressibility coefficients um, multiplied by your delta v all right now in deriving this in deriving this part all right well we actually didn't derive it i'm just stating it we're not going to do any proofs or derivations of this with this result all right you can assume that your beta and kappa values are going to be constant over temperature and volume changes all right, so that means for a system undergoing changes in pressure, what you can write is this following relationship right here, and then you can write it as CP, natural log of T final over T initial, minus V beta V final, uh, P final, I'm sorry, minus P initial. All right, so now we have two expressions that we can use for arbitrary processes involving real gases, solids, and liquids, all right, that help us uh, calculate changes in entropy going from initial temperature, initial volume, to final temperature, final volume, and for temperature, initial pressure, initial, to temperature, final, pressure, final. All right, these are four, I, these are four, real gases, solids, and liquids. That's when we use these kinds of formulations. All right, fantastic. Now, again, going back to our question here, we have one mole of CO gas uh, that's transformed from an initial temperature volume condition to a final temperature volume condition. All right, here we're given uh, the specific molar heat capacity at constant volume. All right, now, and, and it tells us to use our ideal gas values for beta and kappa. All right, so how are we going to approach this problem? What we're going to do is we know a little bit about our beta and kappa values. All right, our, our beta value, we had a relationship for this. It's 1 over volume, delta V over delta T at constant pressure. All right, and if we're dealing with a ideal gas, then we can rewrite this. All right, we can rewrite the inside of this partial derivative using our ideal gas law and so we can write one over v here delta well in our ideal gas law we you know pv equals nrt we can rewrite this for v is just nrt over p and we're going to replace this v with this formulation since we're dealing with ideal gases it's going to make doing this partial derivative a lot easier which is why we're replacing it all right when we do this all right, now we're just taking the partial derivative of this with respect to temperature. That's just going to give us um, 1 over V N. Uh, it's just going to give us 1 over T, actually. All right. We've done this in the previous chapters, 1 over T. 
Now for kappa, we also had a formulation for this. It was minus one over V, partial derivative of volume with respect to pressure at constant temperature, all right? And this gave us one over P, all right? So now we're gonna consider the following reversible process in order to calculate our change in entropy. First, the gas is heated reversibly from 320 Kelvin to 650 Kelvin, all right, at a constant volume. We're going we're gonna to consider that as our first segment, all right? Our first segment is going to be at constant volume. We're going to go from 320 Kelvin to 650 Kelvin, all right? In our second segment, we're going to do constant temperature, all right? And we're going to change volumes. We're going to go from um, 80 liters, I believe that's what we're given, 80 liters to 120 liters. All right, so these are our two segments. What we can do now is we can use our delta S formulation. All right, we can use our delta S formulation, but now we can replace, let's write this down actually, uh, our delta S formulation that we have, TF, T initial is CV over T, DT. All right, we're going to use this formulation right here. Plus, we're changing volume. So it's going to be plus V final V initial over beta and kappa dV. We're using this formulation to, to do changes in entropy because they want us to use our ideal gas values for beta and kappa. All right. It's going to be okay, though, because we know what beta and kappa are here. We have 1 over T and 1 over P, all right, for this. So we're going to rewrite it as such. We're going to rewrite this segment with beta as 1 over T and kappa as 1 over P. All right, that's what we're going to do here. 1 over T over 1 over P. Same thing, we just replaced beta and kappa with uh, their relationship to macroscopic variables, temperature and pressure. All right, D... V. Cool beans, all right? Now, this is just pressure over temperature, all right? This is just pressure over temperature, all right? So we're going to rewrite it one more time as pressure over temperature, dV. Now, what is PT, P over T? All right, using our ideal gas law, this is just equal to NR over V. So we're going to replace this with, with NRV because it's going to be easier to differentiate with respect to dV. All right, so we're going to do that replacement one more time. We're going to erase, and we're going to write NR over V dV. Notice how we transformed what we had initially, beta over kappa. We know our relationship of beta and kappa. It's 1 over T over 1 over P. This is just pressure over temperature. We could use our ideal gas law to replace that with NR over V because we are differentiating here with respect to dV. It's going to be a lot easier to do this. This is going to give us um, NR natural log of V final over V initial. And so now we have our formulation of delta uh, uh, entropy, delta S. It's going to be the CV over T dt plus nr natural log v final over v initial now it's just a matter of plug and chuck that means we're given our uh heat capacity formulation here we're just gonna insert it here all right and then we know our mole numbers our gas constant our v final v initial all right and it's just a matter of plug and chug. I'm not going to solve it fully, but now you know how to obtain the final formula that you need in order to solve it. All right. Fantastic. Now, what we want to do next is use entropy to calculate the natural direction of a process in an isolated system. All right. And to motivate this, this, this discussion, we're going to set the stage by considering two examples, all right? This first example, all right, we discussed this in that first video of Chapter 5. The first example is going to be a metal rod with a temperature gradient, where one half of this temperature gradient, uh, this metal rod, is hotter than the other side, all right? T1 is going to be much hotter than T2 here in our metal rod. All right, will the gradient become larger or smaller as the system approaches equilibrium state? All right, 
So to model this process, we're going to we're going to consider this metal rod, all right, with two different temperature gradients, T1 and T2. They're brought into thermal contact, all right? What's going to happen over time? We discussed this that it's going to reach thermal equilibrium, all right? And the metal rod is eventually going to have a uniform temperature throughout this. All right. So how are we going to calculate delta S for this process using the heat flow? All right. Well, well, we can imagine a reversible process in which the initial and final states, all right, are going to be in thermal equilibrium. In the imaginary reversible process, this rod is going to be coupled to a reservoir, a reservoir whose temperature is lowered very, very slowly. The temperature of the rod and the reservoir are only going to differ very smallly, infinitesimally throughout the process in which an amount of heat is withdrawn from the rod. And the total change in temperature of the rod is going to be related to that heat. All right. So what can we write for this metal rod? Let's work through this. All right. Our DQ at constant pressure, all right, is going to be Cp dt for this metal rod. In other words, we can write that this temperature change is going to be 1 over Cp, all right, dqp, or in other words, qp over Cp. All right, it's going to be assumed that this change in temperature is small enough that Cp is going to be constant over this whole interval. All right, and what we can do now is write the entry entropy change of the composite system all right as a sum of the entropy changes in each rod right because technically we're going to think of each one of these parts of the rod that have different temperatures as having different entropies as well and we can write the entropy change of this whole system all right as the change in entropy of each part all right what that means is we can write entropy change as q reversible one over T1 plus Q reversible 2 over T2. All right, and we can summarize this as this, this heat change is going to be pretty similar as 1 over T1 plus 1 minus, sorry, minus 1 over T2. All right, now we know T1 is greater than T2. And so that means this part in our parentheses is actually going to be negative. And so this process has two possible directions if we didn't know how this would play out. All right, pretend we didn't know how this would play out and we're just using the equations that we know to understand this, right? We got this formulation for change in entropy considering the entropy of both sides of this metal rod having temperature T1 and T2. Now we're looking at that formulation. We know T1 is greater than T2. That means that this quantity in this parentheses has to be negative that means this process has two possible directions if heat flows from hotter to colder rod then the temperature gradient will become smaller and entropy will be greater if heat flows from colder to hotter then the temperature gradient will become larger and entropy will be smaller all right entropy is going to have the same mag magnitude in both cases just a different sign we know entropy is a useful function for measuring the direction of natural change in an isolated system. All right. And we know experience tells us that the temperature gradient is only going to become less with time. What that means is we can reach a conclusion. It can be concluded that the process in which entropy increases is the natural direction of the natural change in an isolated system. All right. That's going to be really important. All right. That's the conclusion that we want to reach for any irreversible process in an isolated system. There is a unique direction of spontaneous change, the one where entropy increases, all right, for the spontaneous process, all right, one where entropy decreases for the non-spontaneous process, and one where it equals zero for a reversible process. Again, the process where entropy is greater than zero is the direction of natural change in this isolated system. All right, the reverse, or the reverse process is the unnatural direction of change. All right, so for isolated systems, 
we know that the direction of change, spontaneous change, is going to be the one where entropy increases. That's how we know that when we have a metal rod where one side of it is, is at a at one temperature and the other side is at a different temperature, that heat will move <clears throat> from hotter to colder because that is the natural direction that will result in a larger uh, delta S, a larger change in entropy. All right, we're going to stop here. Next time, we're going to continue our discussion with Clausius inequality um, and continue from there. Let me know if you have any questions. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful day.